Oh, holy and gracious God. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your presence with us, Lord God. We thank you that you've come near, that you've revealed yourself in your son, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And he moves amongst us and is the one that we seek to know more, the one that we seek to love more, the one that we seek to model our lives on. So, Spirit of Jesus, would you come and be in our midst? Holy Spirit, would you come and open us up to hear what you might want to speak to us today? Would you give us open ears, Lord, I ask, ears that are alive and quick to hear every whisper of your word? God, would you also help us to be responsive, to be obedient, and to delight in what you're going to say? We come expectant this morning, Lord God, and we ask that you would have your way. Lord, that you would be glorified, that there would be way less of me and way more of you, or more of all of you, Lord, we ask to be in our midst today. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have a little picture for you up on the screen. It's a piece of artwork, and um, it's just hung around my parents' house for a very long time, actually. But it's a beautiful piece of artwork, and it is um, really about this landscape. That's what I love about it. You'll see different things, of course, that art does that. But it's, it's this kind of uh, landscape to, that, to me, looks very windswept. There's also, like, this beautiful, tiny um, a parent and a child, a little dog, um, that speaks to me as well. Uh, I, I really get meaning out of that sense that as a ch- I've been a, I'm a child, you know, I'm also a mum. And that, that image also reminds me of my relationship with my Heavenly Father, that walking together in beautiful landscapes like that and listening to each other, listening to God. I also love it because I've had lots and lots of walks along the beach, as might you have had. I've had long walks along windy stretches of sand uh, where I've just really sought to pray, to kind of search my soul, to reflect, and sometimes just actually experience the joyfulness of being out in, the crea- out in God's creation and the exhilaration of salt and sand and sea and all that kind of stuff happening. But I love, I love in those times listening. And I feel as though quite often when I listen to the wind... It's kind of like how I practice listening to God. It's kind of a way that I've learnt to discern that God is speaking to me through things like the wind. Listening to the wind reminds me of the voice of God and how the Spirit indeed moves. I have here um, at Rabina a sitting place. I'm not sure if you do. Maybe Maybe if you're coming to worship with us online, you're in your sitting place. Your place of reflection, of calm, of quiet, that place where you can be still and know God. I have this place and it's just out in our backyard and I go there every morning. I go there quite early where I am just able to be and listen and journal and read and talk and listen. Listen to what God might be saying and I I kind of guard that time jealously um, because it's so special to me. Have you got a place like that? And what do you do? How do you discern when God's speaking? How do you discern the voice of God? The last few Sundays, we've been um, working through a series that we've called Lord, Teach Us to Pray. It's been a series around the Lord's Prayer, and we've delved into the Gospels where um, this prayer is unpacked. Remember, it's the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to say when he wanted us to begin with our Father. And that just kind of encapsulates even today what it is to hear God is to recognize the sense that we are in the midst of a relationship with God. That when we say our Father, that's not, that, doesn't, that doesn't point to a transaction we have with God. It points to a relationship that we have with God. When we speak his name and we uh, come to him in his presence and we receive from him, we exchange together conversation and thinking and, and talking and listening. In that, in that prayer series, we actually saw the power of Jesus' prayer life the power of the relationship of, between Jesus and his Father. And we also sought to have that experience of a closer intimacy with God in our own lives. We really sought to access his power and his presence in our daily lives. And so that's what kind of brings us to today in just extending ourselves a little bit, continuing in a sense this season of prayer and hearing God. Pete Grieg has been a great resource to us um, as a church and as a family um, over these last weeks. And he says this, that prayer is a living conversation with a loving God. And it means that we must listen as well as talk. 
It means that we must listen as well as talk. And so we're going to unpack what it is to be listening, to be listening to the things that God might be saying to us today. Um, our children, Mike, Mike and I have three children, and those children were actually um, kids that, like all, all of us really, learnt to speak because my husband and I spoke to them. You know, it, it seems very <coughs> excuse me, simple and basic, <coughs> but yet it's an important realisation of how profound it is to learn to speak because there is one who we listen to. And even as small children, uh, they would hear us speak, Mike and I would speak constantly to them, even, even uh, whilst they were uh, not yet born, Mike and I would speak to them. So we learn to speak to God in the same way. We learn to speak to God because God has actually spoken to us. God has spoken to us. God really does speak and God has spoken to us. Now, maybe you're going, okay, hold up, Fiona, just a minute. Maybe there is some of you that are here today uh, and you're maybe not yet a Christian or maybe you're new to faith. Maybe you've been around faith for a while. I don't want to call you an old Christian, but I'll call you a seasoned Christian. Maybe you're one of those or maybe, you know what, you haven't really heard God in a while. Maybe things have been a bit dry. Maybe even you've been hurt by how you haven't been able to hear God for some time speaking to you. But I want to just affirm a promise today in Scripture that regardless of all those things, regardless of who you are or where you're at and where you might sit on this spectrum of faith, of following Jesus, that God has spoken. And God is still speaking and God has more to say to us today. God has more to say to us. God is wanting to speak. And I'm hoping that today in our sharing time that all of us will recognize that we're invited to hear more of God's voice. That means you. That means you. That means you. That all of us. In that all, that means you today. And friends, the the Bible just gives us such a strong basis to be able to stand on this truth. I want to begin by um, a psalm, Psalm 19, that says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare, they declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Leaves me just in awe of how creation pours forth the communicating of God. It declares the awesomeness of God to all of all of God's creation, to every part of it, day after day, day after day, endlessly, everlastingly, creation pours forth speech, revealing who God is. According to this passage, God's existence and his power can so clearly be seen through observing the things that are around us, through observing the universe. Nature itself speaks, to, speaks forth, speaks to and points to the reality of God. The reality of God to us. The order, the intricacy, the wonder, indeed the detail, they all speak of the existence of a powerful and glorious creator. Isn't that amazing? This whole understanding, this whole truth, it's really strongly echoed in so many parts of the New Testament writings, particularly by the Apostle Paul who was actually called to speak to people who weren't part of uh, the tribe of Israel, who weren't traditionally Jewish people, people of Israel. And he had this encounter with God. He, he heard God speak to him. It's a, quite a remarkable story, but he goes on to then bring the good news, what he calls the gospel of grace about Jesus Christ, the son of the living God to people who'd never heard about this Jesus before, had never understood who this Jesus was. And in his teachings throughout many of his letters that he writes to the churches, he's wanting to establish who this God is, who this living God is who speaks and is active in our lives. He says things like this, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his visible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. There is something, as we've just realized, from creation, from the world that is around us, that speaks to us about God, that God is speaking through. So the question of a God who communicates, a communicating God, and the ability for us to hear and to know God was never considered optional for the early church, for early Christians, for the first Christians, but rather it was expected 
It was expected and it was anticipated that this would be the way that we followed Christ. Again, in the way that Paul writes, he wants new believers, people who haven't heard of or understand this God, this God of Israel, this living God, this eternal God, this true God, he wants them to be able to understand how distinct God is from anything else that they may have experienced in their, in their previous religious or devotional life. He says this, remember the way you used to live before you believed in Jesus. Remember how you chased after, were engrossed by, were enchanted with idols that could not speak, that would lead you astray, for they were mere carved images made by human hands. Paul was reminding these new Christians of the, the, the futile nature of such things that had no mouth, that had no voice, that weren't living in any way in contrast to the greatness of God. He also says this, that the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands or human needs as if he needed anything, but rather he himself gives everyone, hear this again, everyone. He gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, that he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him, so they would seek him, know him, reach out to him, find him, because he is not far. He is so close to every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. In him we live and move and have our being. This was a revelation to new Christians. Maybe this is a revelation to you. That we love and serve a living God who created everything, the world and everything that is in it. And in that God is speaking to us. It is speaking to us about the goodness and the majesty and the awesomeness of the God that we serve. Now, in unpacking again how we might also be hearing God, we've got some other ways that I want to just share with you a bit this morning. I want to share about how we've just heard about how creation proclaims and declares and speaks about the goodness and the glory of God. It communicates who God is to us. But also this, friends, is just like the profoundly wonderful piece of um, equipment that we've been given that enables us to hear from God. You know, like, if, if, you're expecting, if you're expecting to hear God speak and you never open these scriptures, that would be like expecting someone in your family to ring but to never, ever be near your phone. There's such a disconnect if we don't recognize that every time you or I open up this book, Every time we open it up, do you realize that on these pages you are hearing God? And the more you read and the more you are learning, the more you are receiving what he has for us in that book, the more we are learning to recognize his voice and for that voice to speak powerfully and profoundly into every part of our life. The Bible is our primary source of revelation and the ultimate authority on which all other words are weighed. One commentator said that God's written word, this here, this is God's permanent address. If you're looking for God, go here. I promise you he'll be found. He promises that to us. We also know that all scripture is God-breathed. That means it's more than just, you know, red binding in a book and pages, words on a page. It's actually all scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God, that's us, that we can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is powerful. It is living because it testifies to a living God. It is able to help us discern the intents and the thoughts of our heart. That's a little bit scary, isn't it? That's a little bit scary. This book can actually help us to see what is in us. Not that, not, that, not that we need to become fixated on this because this book is actually about our fixation on the Lord Jesus Christ. But it does help us to see who we are in light of his love. This book is able to teach us. We're able to read it. We're able to study it. And we are able to listen to God as he speaks through it. 
as, the, as Jesus, the Son of the living God, is revealed in us, we are able to, and I encourage us all to be about what it is to be listening. Jesus also says things like this, the words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. So this book, this book, as we've said, it's, it's God-breathed, but it's also life-giving. It's spirit-infusing for us. And there's been some examples of that in my, in my life and in my life um, as, as a mom and as a wife uh, together in ministry with my husband Mike and with other things that we've done since we've been married and even prior to that. Um, but just moments in time where I've been so aware that this book has revealed things to me that God has wanted to speak. Um, there was one particular situation at the start of 2020. Just cast your mind back. It was kind of, at least for New South Wales, we were in the middle of just sort of a lot of COVID pandemic stuff. Um, but there was beginning to be a restless in our family. We sensed it in different ways. And we came, Mike and I came to the scripture when we actually read in Hosea. It's a book of the Old Testament. It's a very small book, but it talks about this. It says, So righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. Break up your unplowed ground, for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness upon you. That was just like enough for us to go, okay, God, I think you want us to be doing something here. We don't know what it is. We have no idea where this might go. But we will try and understand this sense of breaking up our unplowed ground. We'll pray about this. We'll ask you more questions. We'll ask you to reveal more. Uh, another time, quite recently, in fact, throughout July 2021, whenever I came to open up this book, I got this scripture from Psalm 23, verse, tw- verse 3, that says this, He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Throughout July, for the whole month, every time I came to this book, that scripture would come to my mind. Also, um, an example that I have where, we, where this was kind of discerned beyond our family, beyond my husband and I, uh, in an environment where we had a team ministry setting. And again, it was sort of during the, the pandemic time. And as a church, as a, as a synod and as a presbytery, we were just trying to find from God answers and find ways that we might need to be able to work forward and continue to oversight church as well and see them flourish in the midst of what was happening in the pandemic. And these words from James came to us. Uh, And when I say us, I'm in a ministry team. It says this, My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. That sense of like letting endurance, we knew that we needed to endure. We knew that this wasn't going away. We knew that we needed to endure, but to hear those words together and to understand that God was saying, I want you to go further because let endurance have its full effect. Let it have its full effect. Lean into it. As much as you kind of want to just wish it was over, this is the time to actually fully understand what I'm doing in your midst. That was a really profound word for us as a ministry team and the decisions that we made and the things that we did going forward. I've got a great story of a significant, monumental, spectacular fail, really, of hearing God's voice. And I've had plenty of them. Can I say plenty of them? But, um, but this was one when I was quite a new Christian. I, I was two weeks a Christian. And I don't know who thought this was a good idea, but I got to go on a mission trip. I went to a mission trip to a tiny little country town in New South Wales called Hilston. At Hilston Uniting Church, we ran a day camp for children. And at the end of that day camp... We had a time sitting in the church and we were just thanking God and praising God that the camp had gone well and had come to an end. And I was sitting in the church, my head bowed and my eyes closed. And as I was praying or as someone else was praying, I just sensed the Lord saying, and I saw in my head this picture of me bathed in light. And I heard God say, Fiona, you are right in the center of my will. I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I I was really taken aback by how clear it was to see myself just almost invisible in light, but I was there and there was light and God was saying, Fiona, you're right in the center of my will. It was so exciting for me. And as a new Christian, I just realized that, okay, what do I do? What do I do when when that kind of stuff happens? Oh, I know, I go to scripture. Because God, what God says to me is never going to be out of line with what scripture says. So I go to scripture and I... um, 
all the drive homes were long drive because Hillston's like 700 k's from Sydney. I'm like trying to find where this is in scripture. Like where does God say to somebody that you're right in the center of my will? <laughs> anyway, the thing that most um, appealed to me, the thing that I thought was most relevant was when Paul, the apostle, again, I've mentioned him, he, he gets this call to go to Macedonia. Macedonia is a place in the, in the uh, Near East back then and still a place now, actually. And anyway, Paul has a vision in the night and this man from Macedonia is standing there urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So I actually thought, oh, well, that's what this is about. Actually, Hilston Uniting Church is asking me to come over to Hilston and help them and, like, be me there, like, God wants to use me there, like maybe, or maybe I, this is a place I need to like move to or whatever. Anyway, so I've come home full of excitement. I've kind of heard from the Lord. I've checked it with scripture. I've kind of got my verse. I've gone to the minister at Terry Gore Uniting Church. And I've said to the minister, hey, I'd just love to share with you something. Can I explain to you what happened to me at the end of camp? And I explained it. And, the min- and I said, I think I need to ring Hillston Uniting Church and tell them, basically, that I think I've been called. I've been called to 700 kilometres west of Sydney to this little town and um, the gracious minister allowed me to call the minister of Hilston and we had a phone conversation and he and the minister in Hilston picked up the phone and I shared and I said I think I'm called I think God is speaking to me to come to Hilston and he said actually God hasn't spoken that to me and he put the phone down (laughs) I almost just like that I was like and I was like oh right okay and then you know there was a process of me needing to like pick myself back up again and think to myself okay maybe I got that wrong (laughs) maybe this isn't a Macedonia call thing but it was profoundly beautiful that God was wanting to say something like that to a new Christian that God was wanting to reassure me that as I was seeking to follow him as I was seeking to believe in him as I was seeking to read his scriptures that he was actually saying Fiona you're right in the center of my will and, and, and I love that story because at times when I'm down and I'm discouraged, I just actually remind myself of that story, even though on some levels it was such a failure. But friends, God, uh, God speaks to us in these ways. God is always speaking to us. And God doesn't only speak through these scriptures and through different promises and parts of scripture. But he also um, speaks to those who call him shepherd, who call him good shepherd. And he says that these who call me shepherd will know his character and they'll therefore know his voice. So learning to know God's voice is such a significant part, a part of what it is to be followers of Jesus. Jesus says, my sheep, hear my voice. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep and my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Such a beautiful image of what it is to have one who speaks to us powerfully and tenderly and clearly and how practical that it is for in, in our daily lives. And let me just describe to you this beautiful way that the good shepherd is talked about here. His sheep have heard him sing as he leads them across fields and hills. They have heard his comforting tones in the night when the, when the wolves howl in the distance. They recognize his familiar tone. They know his common phrasings and the pace of his voice, how it rises in the presence of danger and its tenderness in the presence of hurt. They know its authority, its confidence, its care and concern. They will follow that voice anywhere. They will not follow a stranger. They do not know that voice. Friends, Jesus promises that his sheep will hear his voice, that, he, that we will hear it. And I, I'm just so convicted that God is always speaking, that God has spoken and God is speaking even now. And that in that we are all as his flock, as his precious, precious children, as his sheep are hearing him speak. And that that speaking is just done in ways that are profound and unique to each and every one of us. But today I just want to encourage you, if this is something that's new for you and you think that God is speaking, that you're hearing God, that with your seed of faith, with your mustard seed of faith, something is stirring you to say, actually, I want to believe that God is speaking because scripture says it's so true. And it seems so obvious to me that God is alive and living and therefore why wouldn't he speak? And if you're sensing that God is speaking to you today, I just ask that you would just keep your heart soft. 
that you would not hide in your heart or, or, or even um, just sort of let that voice um, be pushed away but make room for it in your heart and see what God wants to do next. And we kind of read how that happened throughout the book of Acts. We read about how uh, in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit was such a force for how the apostles and how the early church uh, was, was started, about how God moved and formed and shaped and birthed the early church and those who were a part of it. I've read through the book of Acts a couple of times this week and I've seen how the Holy Spirit was continually, continually, clearly and dynamically guiding the disciples and the church. The Holy Spirit was relentless in how the Spirit wanted to speak and continue to speak and do it clearly and never cease doing it in the guiding of the church. And it was so dynamic the way that you read it in this story. I encourage you to look at it this week. There's only a few occasions where it specifically narrates the um, disciples stopping and asking for things. I noticed that where prayer happens for the disciples, it came because God had spoken, they had stepped out, and they were just like needing to just get on their knees and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. But the Spirit would often speak first, the Spirit would lead first, would guide first, would instruct and would teach. All through this 28 um, chapters, the Spirit was continually giving them instructions and directions and quite often necessary information clear and precise information, often for their safety, so that they could be the most effective witnesses to Jesus Christ and so that they could teach and share that he was the Messiah and that they could testify to the good news of God's grace. When people heard what the disciples were speaking, it hit them powerfully. It hit them powerfully. Many, many people decided to follow Christ. Many people decided to follow in the way of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit continued to send the disciples and all those who believed out on mission. He would call them to prayer. He would send them to heal and to baptize and to go pray for people to receive the Holy Spirit. The Spirit also spoke through visions and dreams, but the Spirit was always, always encouraging them always in strengthening those who came in contact with the disciples and with the Spirit, and it was always comforting them. 28 verses, 28 verses of ordinary people, ordinary people putting themselves in the way of a loving, incredible God who wants a dynamic relationship and saying, use me, God, and actually watching what Jesus did as he dispatched them to extraordinary and phenomenal and exciting uh, adventures. But I want to emphasize ordinary people. There was something really ordinary about these folks. And you could actually think back yourself or understand from the Gospels just how very ordinary these people were. Paul loves this image as he continues to speak to new Christians and to people uh, as he writes letters to his churches. He says um, in 2 Corinthians verses four, chapter 4, verse 7, but we have this treasure in, clay, in, jar, in jars of clay to show that this all-surpowering, passing power is from God, not us. I stumbled over that. Let me do it again. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Such an important passage for us. Such a profound image metaphor that we have. I love this passage. Paul uses the image of great treasure stored in everyday clay jars, jars with cracks to show us that God puts his riches of his spirit in us. This is what we read about happens at Pentecost. God puts the riches of his spirit in us. He puts his treasure in ordinary cracked pots. Whatever impact our life of faith might have, it is not because of some sort of awesome looking package. It's not because of any exceptional abilities or absolute intelligence. It's because we are weak. It's because we need to lean on God for his strength. And the more broken we are and the more cracks there are for the spirit to actually be poured through. Isn't that amazing? Actually, the more cracks there are, there's just more ability for the spirit to pour through it. The, church, the history of the church has never been about great men and women. It's always been about the great God of ordinary men and women. Friends, I have a, um, have a, a long-standing friend and she gave me a call um, early on Saturday morning 
she lives in Sydney and I got a call about 7.30, a text message actually. She said, do you have a time for a chat today? I replied, sure, I'm working on my sermon, but I can call you around lunchtime. And then I thought, oh, hold up. I sent her a, a next, another message. I said, are you okay? She said, sorry, yes, but I feel like I need a friend and just hoping that you pray for me. So I just dropped everything straight away um, and I just called her. And for about an hour and a half, I just heard her pour out her heart, her heartbreaking kind of story, the situation of a, of a situation with her marriage that's been escalating now for nearly 11 years. And the pain and the perseverance of how she's wanted to honour her husband in that marriage and how that's now affecting um, so many areas of her life, especially the raising of her children. It was kind of a harrowing story, but I just all I felt I could do was listen. But then significantly, she's talked about how isolated she was feeling, and that just really spoke to me. I just thought, she feels so isolated. And I asked her this question, like, um, are there people that you could talk to? Who, who else is around you that you could speak to? She was feeling isolated and alone, and now seemed to be the time that she was ready to talk, and yet she didn't have people around her that she could actually go to. Um, she, she felt as though she didn't have anybody that she could, she could reach out to. She said that they've only been attending uh, the church they're at for a few years now and that she just had some hesitations there to share and to open up and get some support. But anyway, she did say this though. She said, she said Fee, um, I read a little while ago in a book by Bill Johnson, who's a, quite a prolific and amazing Christian writer and teacher and pastor, and in a book of Bill's, he's talked about how sometimes we go through seasons of life where God takes away people so that we can just really strengthen ourselves in God. And as, as my friend shared that, um, and with no uh, discrediting to Bill Johnson, I love what he writes, but I thought I don't think that's the right word for her right now. Something There was just a, such a lack of peace in my heart when she shared that, that that was going to be helpful and beneficial and what God might want for her life right now. So I said to her, you know, is there somebody else? Is there, is there other people? That, I don't think that's going to help you right now. And she actually received that really well and she thought, she thought that that was, that was a great thing for her to think about. Anyway, we prayed together. And during the prayer, I really sensed to read over her Psalm 91, uh, which I did um, at the end of the prayer. But during this prayer time, I just kept getting this name, this slightly, a, a, a name, Inga. Inga. Fiona, say Inga. I wasn't sure about this. It wasn't something that I, um, I just had no prior real understanding of why it would be meaningful, but I, I did manage to say that to her when, I, when we had finished praying. I said, how about Inga? That, that name just keeps coming to my mind. And you can see there um, in her message that as soon as I mentioned that name, she remembered this wonderful woman, a previous elder in her church, uh, who would indeed love and appreciate and be blessed to walk alongside my friend for this season. And, you know, I just saw in that moment, in that hour and a half, really, of this conversation, this conversation where I was a little bit hesitant, I guess. I took a minute to really just want to jump in. I, I, um, I found myself feeling quite helpless and wondering what on earth I was going to be able to say that was going to help or contribute. But, yeah, God had something that God wanted to do. And my friend, um, despite this cracked pot or, you know, this earthen vessel that God had something to say and to speak that would bless and encourage and strengthen and comfort um, one of his children. And, and that, was, that was a profound, profound privilege. But just a very simple moment of a conversation that led to prayer, that led to the Lord wanting to speak. A speak a scripture and also bring, also bring just a name and a word. So as I've been speaking, I just want to sort of share just a for a little few moments, how else, how else might God be speaking? I've just shared my own personal story, even from Saturday, of how, how God works in and through us. But I want to just remind us all that God's voice is always going to speak. It's always speaking. God has spoken and God continues to speak. And that's something for all of us to be invited to receive and to hear and to listen to. But that God's voice is always in line with his scripture. And then his voice can sometimes be in different forms. I mentioned how I just sort of had a name. But also it might come in the, in, in, as, as a conviction, like a sense of like an urgency around something that needs to be done or changed. Sometimes it just comes into one's conscious or it, often it's a sense of peace. I didn't have a sense of peace when she shared 
about what it is to be on her own at the moment. But the scripture tells us Corinthians, sorry, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says that let peace rule your heart. And so in that moment, and often as God is speaking and revealing himself, and as we listen, peace will come into our hearts that we might know that it's God at work. Often it's an impression or a picture. Um, Mike Pilavache, our great friend, says that sometimes hearing God is just like a butterfly landing. A beautiful image to describe a lot going on there, but but I love the way that that just um, speaks to how God can be working in our midst. As I mentioned too, from reading through Acts and through previous experiences, God's voice can and should be discerned in community, in our midst together here as God's people gathered. We see this repeatedly in Acts as well. We also know that God's voice is most active to people who are surrendered and who are surrendered in their obedience to him and who are willing to be open and say yes to God. You know, just to conclude, um, there is a powerful story in the Old Testament. It's in the first book of Kings, and you probably are already quite familiar with it. It's a story where Elijah, a phenomenal prophet, goes out and he has this, he he defeats 450 um, prophets, false prophets of Baal, and it is just phenomenal. They're all wiped out. It's quite a fantastic story of victory that God has, has executed through a prophet. But, you know, like um, as this story goes on, we actually find that um, the Lord has something more. Out of this mighty act, the Lord actually has something more that he wants to say to Elijah. And he says to Elijah that he, he's going to actually speak again. God's going to do something dramatic again. And so, but what this is, the way that God so dramatically spoke was not how any of us as readers of this story or even Elijah himself was expecting because uh, what happened was, was that the Lord said, go and stand before me on the mountain. And Elijah did this and the Lord passed by. He was going to do something amazing. And there was a mighty windstorm that hit the mountain. There was a terrible blast that set rocks being torn loose. But the Lord was not in that wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. There was a sound of a gentle whisper. Friends, I believe that in all of the dramatic ways that we encounter God in Scripture and even in our own lives, there is a reality that God has a gentle whisper for all of us. And and when I think about a whisper... As I think about Elijah and that gentle whisper that comes to him, some translations calls it the still small voice. But friends, if you are going to hear a still small voice, that has to be so close to you that you can almost feel the breath of that whisper on your cheek. It's a beautiful picture about how that closeness of God, that proximity of us to him is so real and so vivid. That God has spoken. God is always speaking and he's speaking to us right now. And that might be that he is just making you aware of his tender whispers of love, of encouragement, of strength and of comfort. There's a story of a German farmer who at the time of harvest was harvesting the hay in bales. And when he put all the hay bales into the barn and when he'd finished all of that work, he suddenly realised to his horror that his watch had come off sometime when he was putting the hay in the barn. It wasn't an ordinary watch. It was a unique and antique watch. It was owned by his grandfather. It was one of those old-fashioned ones that sort of went tick, 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 tick. One of those ones you'd wind up. He tried to look for it, but trying to look for a watch in a hay barn was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. So after a while, he went home and he sat with his family at the table and he said, I've lost granddad's watch and I feel terrible. His little boy, who was just eight, he said, I'll go find it for you, daddy. And the dad said, how are you going to find it, son? It's a huge hay barn. Well, he said, 
he, and the father said, you're never going to find it. Well, anyway, the little boy slipped out from the table. And at the end of dinner, he went to the hay barn and he climbed on top of the hay. And he lay on top of the hay bale and just lay there for a long time. He kept lying there for even longer until after a while he could hear that his breath, he could hear his heart beating. And after a while longer, he could hear very gently the very quiet tick, tick, tick. And after a little while longer, he started to work out where that tick, tick, tick was coming from. And then after a while longer, he was able to then just move around the hay bales until he found the watch. When we hear God, it is often that whisper. It is often because we've stilled ourselves, because we've quieted our souls, because we are taking a moment to be still and to know God to know that God is near, to know the whispers of the breath of God on our cheek and to hear the quiet tick, tick, tick of what he has to say to us. God has spoken, church. God has spoken to his church throughout the ages. He is the living God. He is the true God. He is the God whose voice is poured forth in all of creation. He's the God who comes and is revealed in Jesus Christ, his son, who calls us to hear his voice. As a sheep, hears the voice of the shepherd. And today, may our hearts be open to hear afresh, to be stilled, to be quiet, and to be open, that we might be people who hear and who respond who act in faith, who bravely step out, trusting in the one who whispers to us, trusting in God's goodness, trusting in God's plan that he is wanting to unfold, that he has so delighted in us being key central parts of his making of history. That is our invitation today to hear his voice, to position ourselves to listen and to wait. To wait until he's able to speak, knowing that he speaks and is speaking now. 